Good morning, everyone. So before we get started, I want to recognize some of our utility staff that uh, made their way down to College Station. First is Wayne Robinson. He's the new lead worker for the utility portfolio section. If you have any project-specific questions, your first points of contact are our utility specialists. So representing the districts in the north is Paul Fierro. Representing the districts in the south is Mario Mendez. Renee Laurendine represents districts in the east. And for a limited period of time, we have Mike Powers that's representing the districts in the west. Mike is leaving us to go acquire land so that we can have it for utility purposes. And then we have Tim Kirkpatrick, who's the auditor in all things by America. We run through Tim. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. This morning, Tim and I are going to talk to you all about utility accommodation strategies that we're employing, some tools and resources that we have available for your use. Tim is going to give an update on Buy America requirements, and also he'll talk about current initiatives and best practices that we're employing for utility accommodations and then we'll have a little time afterwards for Q&A. So i first like to talk about the utility accommodation strategies that we are focusing on in the Row 100 course that's identifying and uh, managing utility conflicts. And it's taught in partnership with uh, TTI, Cesar Quiroga is the instructor. So a part of the accommodation strategy is for us to prioritize how we consider dealing with the utilities. And the first priority is for us to try and avoid utility conflicts, if at all possible. And in instances where we can't avoid utility conflicts, say through designing around uh, impacted facilities, we then want to minimize any impacts that we have on the utilities. And once we've gone through the avoid process, we couldn't avoid, we've tried to minimize the impacts. The last resort is for us to accommodate those impacted utilities. So in the real world, what does that look like? Let's go through an example. Here we have an, a utility facility. In this particular example, we have an impacted utility um, that's in conflict with the proposed roadway ditch grade. So we can coordinate with the designers early on in the project development process to try and design around it. Here's one example of how you can design around it. Redesign and include a retaining wall to remove that conflict with the proposed ditch grade. If that scenario is not possible, then we want to try and minimize impact. So here we have a utility facility in the right-of-way. And again, we have a proposed roadway ditch grade. In this instance, they can't put a retaining wall, so they'll redesign and minimize the impact with the proposed roadway ditch grade by uh, covering the impacted facility with a concrete cap. Now, say we go through these two scenarios and neither one are feasible for whatever reason. We have the same utility facility. We have the proposed roadway ditch grade. We can't redesign to minimize or avoid the impact altogether. Then we go ahead to accommodate the, that utility. In this case, we've lowered that line. So over the past year, we've been working to implement some tools to better assist us in communicating with the utility companies and go through this avoid, minimize, and accommodate process that we talk about in the Row 100 course. And so one tool I want to point out is the notice of proposed construction. And what this template does for us is provides a, consi a consistent mean for TxDOT to communicate with the utility companies early on in the project. So Say, for example, we have the initial project kickoff meeting. We know kind of what the schematic footprint is going to look like. We want to start communicating that as soon as possible with the utility companies to say, hey, we have a road, proposed roadway project. Here's where it is. Please let us know if you have any facilities that are along this corridor. 
after we've uh, given notification to the utility companies, we start to collaborate with them as soon as possible. We want to collaborate with the TxDOT project team, so that's environmental, the designers, the project managers, utility coordinators, right of way, but we also want to bring the utilities to the company, to the table as well. And so this is when we start to actually go through the avoid and minimize strategies. Once we've gone through that and we know that we just can't avoid these utilities, then we want to send out the notice of required accommodation. This provides us documentation that we've notified the utility companies now that they're required to move uh, based on our projects. And it lets them know what the let date is, kind of what the schedule of events will be like, and we start to plan around that with our project schedules. Now, we've had utility companies to complain once we let them know that, hey, you're required to accommodate based on our transportation projects, and they say, okay, well, we have this thing called Buy America. It's going to take us some time to order these materials, but we don't have a contract with you, so sorry. What can we do? What we've created is the master utility agreement that is available at this time for utility companies to execute on a one-time basis utility-wide across the state. And this master utility agreement, number one, says that if we provide you with the notice that you are required to accommodate, you can begin incurring charges on preliminary utility activities. So sue activities, design, ordering materials that have long lead times, and we will pay you based on the charges that you've incurred once you execute the standard utility agreement. The master utility agreement also goes on to provide assurances to the utility companies that in the event that TxDOT has a need to redesign, we will reimburse you at 100% of the cost of any subsequent move or any subsequent work that's related to that redesign. It doesn't matter what your compensable interest is at that time. So we're trying to work better. We're trying to partner better with the utility industry to let them know that we are taking the avoid, minimize, and accommodate strategy seriously. We're implementing this process throughout TxDOT statewide, and it is having a better effect on our transportation projects that we've seen so far. So moving on to some available resources that we have, one is the utility accommodation, coordination, and verification contracts. So try and say that fast three times. We tried to no avail, so we know, uh, call this the UACV contracts. But these contracts act uh, to provide an extension to district utility coordination personnel. It's a non-professional services contract, so you can't hire a vendor to do the sue or the design. However, we can hire consultants to perform the coordination activities to serve as the liaison between the TxDOT districts, the right-of-way division, and the utility companies to move these projects forward. Another resource we have available is the use of demolition and disposal contracts. So I would like to point out that the expectation is still for the utility companies to go out and clear the right-of-way in preparation for their relocations, but there may be instances where you have a need to expedite this activity. So one example that comes to mind is where you have a project with all non-reimbursable utilities. Well, tell me what utility is going to raise their hand to be the first to go out there and bear the cost of clearing the right-of-way and let all of the other utilities benefit from it. So when you have those types of instances, make the call, use the demolition and disposal contract so that we can have the right-of-way clear for the utilities to move. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to give an update on the Buy America requirements and also to go through some of our current initiatives. Thanks, Sharon. Good morning. I'd like to talk a little bit about Buy America. I know there are several in the room. Excuse me. I know there are several in the room that are familiar with Buy America. For those that are not, it is legislation that requires iron and steel procured on federal contracts with federal money. 
uh, be, be manufactured in the United States. Uh, this is set forth in, sorry, set forth in both the USC and the CFRs 23.313 and 23.635.410 respectively, and it requires that all contracts eligible for assistance under the chapter for a project carried out within the scope of the applicable finding, determination, and decision under the NEPA, regardless of the funding source of such contracts, and so on, if at least one contract for the project is funded with the amounts made available to carry out this title. Very lengthy way of saying, if it's federal money involved relating to the procurement of iron and steel, um, this is the legislation that, that, that uh, governs this. Uh, we have detailed these items as well in our right-of-way manual uh, under in Chapter 3, Section 2, uh, and that's accessible uh, both internal and external to TxDOT. Um, Buy America compliance is not optional. Uh, this is, there, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, but, it, but Buy America does require that utility work uh, that qualifies for reimbursement based on, upon property interest uh, cannot be excluded from these compliance requirements. At the end of the, of the day, these utilities provide services, uh, commodity-based services to individual users. Um, if they are not required to pursue these reimbursements, subsidies, credits, whatever you want to call them, um, then what's happened here is that TxDOT or maybe the Federal uh, Highway Administration has, has forced this utility to incur additional costs to make this adjustment if we cannot uh, avoid. So we don't, the government, uh, state or federal, do not want that cost passed on to those uh, end users. And so these reimbursements are available for that purpose. Um, There are some minimal allowances made for this uh, legislation. There are also waivers that are available. Um, the most important thing to point out right now is that the waivers typically relate to cost and some other sourcing, etc. Uh, but right now, the waivers are uh, granted very rarely. Um, and so it, it doesn't seem intuitive to someone to think, well, I can save a tremendous amount of money if I purchase this material that's made in a foreign land. That, that goes against the human and physical capital goals of, 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 of our federal tax dollars. Um, you can't, with trade tariffs, et cetera, there's a lot of you, barriers that you cannot uh, impede as far as the flow of materials and goods. But when there's federal tax dollars at stake, you can put requirements that this money be spent domestically um, with American manufacturers. Sorry. Um, we, there was some, some guidance that was made available uh, and concurred with by the Federal Highway Administration um, and, 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 and stated that uh, there were certain utility structures composed of more than 90% uh, of iron by weight and subject to Buy America. And as well, the guidance also provided uh, some specific uh, examples for structures uh, to, to give, provide some clarity to the utility industry as to what were the expectations. Uh, encasement pipes, very, very, very obvious, notable steel and iron uh, components. Um, very typical in construction as well. These are very easily identifiable, but when you expanded, this was expanded through MAP 21, it, it, the utility industry had not seen anything like this requirement before. And there are lots of areas with, especially telecoms, uh, that, that it's not black and white. It's not very clear what is subject to this. So, the original guidance was challenged, rescinded, and we've since then drafted new guidance that has, has, was effective June 19th, although with compliance, it's like anything else, it's a very dynamic issue. It's never static for very long. 
there will be small changes. And so things get challenged, things get pulled back. We have new guidance that was effective June 19th, but we've, we've got a, waiver, a, a process now where we're asking for an extension because there's been some, a few utilities around the state that have, that have taken a look at some of the new uh, aspects of this guidance and it's going to significantly impact their operations. They've got to go out, source new suppliers, et cetera. One of the, one of the biggest changes or, uh, to the new guidance was the uh, miscellaneous steel. Um, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, was miscellaneous steel. Miscellaneous steel was just that. It was, uh, it was valves, it was fittings, it was uh, uh, attachment materials, uh, bolts and bolt, nuts and bolts. These items now have been redefined they are now, if they're comprised of 100% steel or iron, they now have to fall into a situation where they have to be compliant material. Uh, the only exception those items can now have would be de minimis under the minimal allowance, and it's only $2,500 or a tenth of a percentage point. So even on a $5 million utility adjustment, $5,000 of non-compliant materials are all you can be allowed uh, to install on that. So. We are working with the utility industry right now, um, listening to them. Uh, we've got, uh, we, we, we took, considered a lot of their, uh, the impacts of their operations. We, we, we took it to the Federal Highway Administration. They agreed and have since granted the extension to, uh, to June of next year. One that I'd like to talk about now are just some of the process and procedural considerations with Buy America. How do you start off on target and stay on target? And, and, and the most important aspect of Buy America is that it's included in the design phase engineering. Uh, so there has to be consideration for compliance in design. Um, we, on the utility side, we are dealing with smaller structures and smaller projects in comparison to say large bridges. Um, but if you were to design a, a bridge or, or, or an apparatus of some sort that included patented technology that manufacturing only supported coming out of Germany, you've designed failure right from the get-go. And so design considerations must be made. Early identification of materials uh, subject to Buy America and other compliance considerations. Once again, the active early identification um, subject to the Buy America, we, 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 we recommend that and require that at, with, with cost estimates, um, but many times cost estimates are, are after the fact, after we've designed um, we haven't had any consideration for is this, are these products available domestically, are there lead times involved, et cetera. So it, it's very, very critical to uh, identify these items early. Um, communication, extending the compliance requirements to third parties and design engineering firms. This is critical. We at the TxDOT, we have an obligation to enforce federal compliance. That utility enters into an agreement with TxDOT and it states in that agreement that they will adhere to and comply with Buy America. If they don't stay, take that time and push it forward to the suppliers, they could ultimately end up with, a, with an order of goods and receive goods that the, no one aside from them knew had to be manufactured in the United States. And that's after the fact and it can be very costly. Um, And I say internal and external to the utility industry because it is critical. You, you, might, you might have a utility uh, industry that uh, uses a certain supplier, but if that supplier is unaware of this compliance regulation, they can get into trouble pretty quick. Um, review and revision of documentation standards. We are in the process of doing that now. We've, uh, we, we are um, requiring less and less technical documents and more and more or just natural certifications from the uh, manufacturers or, or the suppliers of, this, of these goods. Um, verification of the documentation and materials prior to installation. This is, this is the number one requirement of the feds. 
that you review and inspect these items prior to installation. Why? We put a pipeline in, then we cover it with dirt and pavement. It's very expensive and, and sometimes not, a, you, you cannot go back and undo that. So lastly, the reimbursement procedures that are detailed into the right-of-way utility manual, um, and with, this is with consideration for lump sum. Some, the, some of the biggest uh, revisions that were made to the right-of-way uh, manual were the updates to the, to the uh, guidance by the Federal Highway Administration, the Buy America Documentation and Inspection Activities. We've added some, some new verbiage around that. We have, uh, we've also updated it for the types of right-of-way releases available through ROAS, providing additional detail and guidance on cost estimates and lump sum and uh, further clarifying the timelines that the utilities should work off of to submit reimbursements. Uh, quickly, is our, our current initiatives and best practices within the utility portfolio section, and these are spearheaded by, by Sharon, um, and, and we're carrying it out at, with the team, is we have revised and updated the right-of-way utility manual and text.e forms that relate to the forms that Sharon uh, pointed out to you earlier. Those are all available on eForm. Revising forms and requirement doc documentation for Buy America certification, making it much easier to get these certifications. Uh, we've implemented statewide training program that's both internal to TxDOT resources, external resources that work for us under the UACV. We are also, uh, we've taken a top-down approach. Sharon is working with Kyle and, and, and Gus and the TP&D and the DEs around the state, the, even the administration. The, everybody from the administration down is very, very committed to ensuring that we are compliant with Buy America. Uh, the utility industry, they are coming around. They are slowly understanding that this is, the is this is their issue, but we are working to schedule on-site training uh, engineering firms and third party, we're trying to work and schedule on-site training in, uh, with them as well. Um, lastly, uh, the, Wayne, as Sharon pointed out, has created a, a, an electronic inbox that allows uh, the documents related to utility agreements to now be sent via electronic versus uh, Pony Express. Um, and we're implementing risk and control-based tools to aid in the decision-making affecting overall utility adjustments statewide. I push lump sum every day um, because of the fact that we have resource challenges and we need to spend money quickly, timely, and we need to, and the effect it has. So last is uh, developing a certification program with utility companies to kind of monitor and periodically test some of their cost basis so that we take that challenge off of the districts uh, and then we're also reviewing and assessing the impact of uh, Senate Bill 1289 and other emerging impacts on compliance. Um, I've taken some of the Q&A time out. I apologize. Yeah, that, that's okay. If, if you have any questions, get with Sean, get with Tim, get with the utility folks that you saw around the room. I apologize. We're trying to stay on schedule. Uh, we promised Mr. Hopman we'd do so, and we're going to try to do so.